Who it is? Who it is? <laughs> Who it is? The freaking pig master. <laughs> the pig master. Hello everyone and welcome to the Wolfside channel. It's still a few weeks and a few months ahead, but Henrik was showing a big stream with all the territory control features and all the territory control shit. And yeah, that was a lot, a lot. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't compress it anymore. But first we will look at what Henrik showed us and then I will go through the random questions and answers list. So obviously everything starts with a house or a stronghold or a keep, right? In this case, we started from a stronghold and we enabled the territory control from this building. People say that we have a lot of empty, boring spaces in the world. This is why. <laughs> Tweak some areas to have a little bit more space. We're also looking to uh, loosen up some of the placement rules to make sure that it's a little bit easier and more forgiving to place buildings. Quite a few of the different buildings. Um, I broke a house. Uh, this, this is an important building for when it comes to defense and sieging. This is the barrack building. The upgrades here, you will get different types of access to the NPCs that allows you to um, set schedule for guards and also uh, get equipment for sieging, siege tents, stuff like that. So this, this is going to be an important building for those services. This is our first tier bank, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so in this build, we're missing um, science. So we're gonna we have science upcoming in next build that will make it a little bit easier to see what's going on, right? So our first tier of bank, quite basic, crude, and then you can upgrade that into a tier three bank tier. So this is a library. I think it's a tier two or so library. We have um, let's see, <clears throat> bank. So this is an upgraded bank building. As you can see, we cleared up space more, two entrances, so it's not too crowded, right? We've got, uh, is it a broke or upgraded bank? Uh, house, normal, and this is our might, the priest house. So the difference between the tiers is not only cosmetic, more hit points, but also it gives you more NPC services and functions. You will have more options and rules to set depending on, on the tiers. We got a little uh, marketplace. Uh, so here obviously we'll be able to hire additionally in place the um, different NPCs. So you can offer uh, general services similar to any NPC city in the world. And uh, this is also where things are getting uh, quite much more interesting compared to the first game. In this case, what I'm talking about here, we're going to go through them a little bit as well on the slides, the rules for that. So you can hire these NPCs, right? And have an up, upkeep to have them in your city. But it's also the thing that, so again, in the first game, you could place one NPC and you could go grind X amount of resources and sell them into infinity. So you just simply printed infinite amount of money to your city without ever having to leave your city. Things like that that didn't really play well with the world trade economy, regional based resources and so on. And that's when we take a, a big leap forward, which I think is going to be very exciting for the game and also help moving around in the world, making it interesting for players to run, maintain cities, but also have interactions of uh, alert tower i think we have yeah so this is a tier one version of this as you can see quite self-explanatory you can pull this uh, line not in this build but that is how you can alert your guildmates uh, you know a signal flare message here we have a tier three better radius better effects um stable upgraded stable so here you will have uh access to your pets in the city uh so this is uh this is important defensive buildings that you may put tactically in corners or so because this is your watch towers pretty much a guard tower which obviously you can climb up on and this is also where you can have guard posts <clears throat> so a good overview obviously good for defense and having guards as well this is a mobile version right you can see it have, have uh, wheels and if you, you can connect, uh, you, you tag into this position um, and then this, this is a very engaging, fun component because one person can sit here in the machineries and you charge it. So the guy up here controls it and he needs manpower to uh, allow it to move forward. So when he sits there and he needs to move it, he tells his friend, you know, take position and st standing here. And when they're standing here, he can actually control it moving forward and rotate it and so on. 
yes, you will be able to fire while moving. So, but like I said, this is not obviously a, it's not a fast moving tank, right? If you have one or two players, it moves slowly. If you have all four, it's more effective speed on it, you know, more reasonable. That's also balance things, right? We place these stationary um, machineries. Obviously, we want to make sure that they're not hindered too heavily like this here. We want, so we may expand this a little bit to put this more on the edge. So you have full out view. So every keep and house starts with a small radius of territory that can be activated. So that's kind of the first step of engaging into a territory. Keep have a specific rule set beyond everything else. How, from houses, strongholds and keeps can engage into ter territory. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, certain rules and also how far they can go from housing to keep. So housing and, and a stronghold is pretty much the same. So one of the main difference from a house, for instance, and stronghold is more the radius and some of the buildings that you can access to. Keep have no limitation on radius growth and obviously fully fledged access to all building and upgrades. And it's also the keep owners that kind of sets taxes in, in the lands. So anyone that lives on your lands, you can um, control taxes on. Keep owning guilds can expand that territory in tiers by spending prominence. So that's also how you expand your radius. Each tier of territory expansion costs more prominence. Each tier of territory expansion has a guild rank requirement. So, uh, and that's also a new thing from that we didn't have in the first game. Tier has a higher prominence upkeep power. Uh, this is separate from upkeep added by structural NPCs and, and a base upkeep that uh, the guild must maintain to sustain their territory size. When two territory areas from different keep owning col guilds collide when trying to expand, they will stop and cannot grow anymore. When this happens, they need to either siege each other or agree to not grow anymore. Uh, players can see a message in the new territory tab alerting them that uh, their territory growth is blocked with the name of the guild the blocking territory belongs to. So that kind of, you know, makes it clear what's going on. Tax your neighbors too much. They may go against you or want to leave and that's not beneficial for you as a landowner so I, I think you should find or at least try to find that range that makes people all right by living there right territory from keep owning guilds does not collide with territory from player housing instead it just continue past over them this does not affect the ability for players owning the house to place new things in their small territory area. When a keep is destroyed, the territory area connected to it slowly ticks down until a new keep is built in its place. There is a hard set guild rank requirement needed for a player to be able to place or build anything within the guild's territory. Okay, obtaining territory. Player houses. Player houses have a new tab in the house UI where a new item can be placed to create a territory radius around the house. So, so that is for the minimum. If you want to start your own little farm, for instance, this is, you know, the first step for you. Uh, this can only be done if the player is in a guild. So, you know, you, you can do that with a one-man guild as well if you want to, uh, taking that first step. But it's not going to be practical the further you want to expand into this, as you will understand naturally. Uh, if the guild has no territory already, this can only be done by the guild leader. The territory belongs to the guild. Other members of the guild may do the same and create disconnected areas of territory belonging to the guild with their own player houses. They can use the same new UI page to remove the territory from their house if they don't want it. Keeps. Keeps can already only be placed when in a guild as you know. Keeps gain territory as soon as they are fully constructed. Guild ranks. <clears throat> so this is a new uh, system as well that we didn't have in the first game. Guild, guilds can now make progress towards earning ranks and this is quite fun for the whole team to actually work towards goals and uh, do achievement and you know do things your guild ranks is displayed in the territory tab so everyone gets access to this with a progress bar similar to clade gift ranks i'm gonna show you this ui in a moment as well ranks are earned via capturing and holding supply towers throughout the world as well as having prominence requirements per rank increase <clears throat> increasing your guild ranks will allow you to expand your territory place and build more kinds of structures and upgrades to existing structures in your territory or place more of a certain kind of structure for example you may be able to place one bank in your ter uh, territory including all territory from disconnected houses from guild ranks one to four and at rank five you can place a second bank 
somewhere in your territory. Guilds can lose experience and ranks by losing a war, uh, having their keep destroyed, having zero prominence available with an active prominence drain upkeep, having zero gold in the treasury with an active gold drain upkeep. For every day spent in either or, or both states, you will lose one guild rank. So you have to maintain your city and your reserves in these currencies. Surplus. We had some of this in the first game and we are refining it this time around. So Glory. <clears throat> Clade Gift Experience has been renamed to Glory. And that's also to unify and make it very clear. Earning 12 Glory will add 12 prominence to your guild, for instance. There are many new titles for earning Glory. So one way of obtaining uh, prominence to your guild and kingdom, you need to uh, hunt anything that gives you, you know, as in today, the Clade Gift Experience. So, And that gives you Glory. Uh, we have might only gain when killing war targets or destroying structures in war. Uh, there are new titles for earning might as well. Prominence is drained from the enemy guild equal to the amount of might gained by the player. Sabotage for enemy guilds by doing this, obviously. And then we have surplus. Gain through non-combat related tasks such as running parcels or doing supply runs. And there will most likely be more options down the road, but th these are the first basic ones we cover. Prominence. So prominence is gained by the individual in the guilds earning glory or surplus, as described before. Capturing and holding supply towers and other tasks. So this gives a lot of exciting, engaging um, components for the whole group to work towards as a goal and also keep enemies on the track. Prominence is used to purchase specific things from the city NPCs and for upkeep on territory size and place structures and NPCs like vendors. Structures and NPCs can drain prominence from the guild as upkeep. The new territory UI shows current prominence value of your guild for players above certain ranks, statics such as total prominence gain lost that day, total prominence drain per tick, breakdown of each contributing structure or NPC, a table showing which players have contributed prominence to the guild and how much including a history of last week of activity. So this is how you can see that your guild members are doing their, their, their job, you know, you're active, if you have set your own guild goals, you can keep track of this in the guild to see who is contributing or who is not or even who is losing. Treasury and taxes. So treasury, players can access treasury information by opening the new territory tab. Uh, there they can view current treasury value for players above a certain rank, upkeep cost for the city, total gold rank per hour stick, breakdown of each contributing structure or NPCs, how many players houses in your territories are contributing to treasury payment, statics such as uh, total gold gain lost per day that day. Donation to the guild treasury, how much and from who. Players can also donate gold to the treasury via the new steward NPC. Since an upkeep tax, all houses within the territory range of a keep have their upkeep affected by a modifier set by the keep guild. Players can set the tax rates for uh, houses in the territory tab. Players can choose to modify the upkeep taxes from between one up to three times the normal upkeep rate. Uh, upkeep paid by the players for their houses within the territory range of a keep gets transferred into the keep treasury. Vendor and supply system. Uh, so vendors. Players can purchase vendor stalls which can be placed and built inside or, uh, or outside like houses. When a structure is built, the vendor NPC will appear. All the vendors in the city are connected to the city the supply pool. When you sell or buy an item from the vendor, the supply pool of the city depletes. The items you sell or are not added to the vendor's stock of the items you or another player can't buy them back. Uh, when the supply pool decreases, it con contributes to the creation of production goods. Items in the steward storage. Once the supply pool is empty, players must do a supply run to refill it. We talked a little bit about this before as well. Players can set the tax modifier with vendor attached to the structure. That this tax modifier increases the prices of the vendor's items, and this added tax value goes into the guild treasury when items are bought from vendors. And we have an ex example here below. We're going to talk a little bit more about the supply runs because the, those are some of the main components to maintain successfully a city. And it's also something that, like I've said before, the, the, you can't just magically print money and have infinite amount of resources on your vendors. You need to refill these in an effective way. And that's a very exciting, engaging way that we're going to cover a little bit more in depth as well. All right, let me continue, guys. We only have a few more slides and then we're going to go to some of the goodies and um, 
we can discuss more freely, right? So this is the supply refill system that I mentioned. And this is going to be very exciting to see how that engages. So we don't get to the stellar state with, that we had in the first game. You print your money, you print your resources, and you are all inside the walled gates. And the only left thing left to do is, you know, siege. There's nothing in between. We want to add a lot in between. So supply runs. As a city supply pool depletes, production goods items will be generated in the steward storage so what this means the more you buy from the npcs the more you sell the more slowly that depletes and it and it adds to this uh, steward storage pool players must take these items to a, an npc town and sell them to a vendor npc in exchange for supply goods uh, once the player takes out the production goods a timer will start counting down until production goods may be taken out again so you can't spam it and abuse it this means players need to choose wisely when they want to do their supply runs players must then transport the supply goods back to their city and give them uh, to the steward npc the supply goods will refill the supply pool more or less depending on how far the player's city is from where they exchange them in a town making longer trips more valuable to maintain full efficiency on your services you do a, a trade with uh, another city nation and it ha the closer it is the less efficiency you get on those goods the further away the higher efficiency you get uh, which means you will have the services and pools filled gr more greatly siege tents plans are bought from the quartermaster npc who appears when you upgrade your barrack to a tier 3 the barrack can only be placed in a territory owned by a stronghold or keep this means you need to have a stronghold or a keep to source uh, and build your own siege machines Otherwise, you need to buy them from other players willing to sell them. Siege Tents Tents plans can be placed like houses and they built, uh, then they're built by players. Siege Tents requires resources to build like a house. The tent contains barrels of bolts and piles of boulders for players to get ammunition for all siege machines. The tent stone amounts is depleted when uh, taking a boulder and wood and metal when taking ballista bolts. Players need to refill these resources and repair the tent to refill uh, the ammunition supply to fuel their siege machines. Siege machines can only be built close to a siege tent. So again, this is where we wanted to refine sieging and supply running from the first game and make it more meaningful uh, and, uh, you know, interesting and balanced in a better way. Uh, outside every keep spot, there are two supply lines. I'm sure you've seen those buildings near any keep. Attacking uh, players can occupy and damage these lines to lower and, uh, the defense of the keeps, walls and keep itself. Owning these supply lines gives a bonus to all structures defensive value and the city supply pool max cap. <clears throat> these lines can be upgraded uh, <clears throat> and higher tiers add more NPCs such as guards. These supply lines have uh, a specific structure in them that can be destroyed. To siege a supply line, players must first build a siege tent and siege machines nearby the supply line and destroy this specific building. When this structure is destroyed, a timer starts. When a timer is reached, uh, the supply line is, is disconnected from the keep. If both supply lines are disconnected, the guild's territory will start to uh, decrease in size at the same rate as it would if the treasury were emptied or if the guild had zero permanence while having an uh, active gold permanence drain. Once the supply lines have been uh, repaired, the territory will stop shrinking and they cannot be disconnected again for four hours. Obviously those numbers will be balanced around our play session. Uh, when this happens, the keep and city will lose defense over time. So the, we also talked about this before. So the key to have a effective siege another keep is not just go there and brute force, uh, you know, one million bowlers like it was in the first game. Here you need to do it tactical, um, attacks on the supply lines first cut them off from the enemy start them out make them uh, suffer in defense which slowly ticks down over time and now it's much more effective to actually siege the keep location in itself so yeah obviously this would be a key component during our uh, test sessions because there's a lot of values and numbers here that we want to have in a safe good spot so protecting and fighting around these supply lines will be you know a key vital part so this supply lines is only for keep now we're going to the last uh, slide supply towers so this is the difference right obviously we want candy for everyone from small groups to large groups right 
Uh, and this is what we call supply towers. They're quite similar to a supply line, but they, we call them towers for now. Uh, there are a multitude of new supply towers placed throughout Milan, which can be captured by guilds. So a a anyone, right? Capturing and holding a supply tower will provide a boon to your guild, such as prominence or even increased defense on your structures. So quite similar to the lines. These towers are designed to change hands relatively easily uh, and to provide a source of constant conflict as guilds compete for control. So this one, these towers are for everyone, from house owners to keep owners. And you can have infinite amounts. Obviously, it would be quite impractical to hold them all because, you know, there are going to be a huge demand for them and there would be an ever-going command, you know, conflict battle for them. These are refined sprint 5 in detail. So on our website, it only says territory control, right? We have split it down in a little bit more details on what's going on. As I said, we're collecting heavy data feedback on a lot of usage for strongholds, keeps. Just to make it a little bit more short, yeah, there will be more mounts. We all can test territorial control first before they will deploy it on the live. And what I'm personally missing on this fucking list is where are the board games, Henrik? In the first roadmap, there were board games. I, I would like to play poker. And uh, then he showed the new interface for territorial control. As you can see here on the left, the social winner that you already have in game. We're adding a new component, which is the prominence. So this is a cool little nifty tool. So if you tell your guild, look, we have a very important goal. We need to reach X amount of thousand prominence this week. Get to work. Everyone need to deliver their part. So this way you can actually see this guy, Lord Gren Grenshinson. <laughs> he actually uh, gave us 260 prominence this latest week. He's done his, he, he's done his task. The minimum was 200 per week, for instance. And he gave us that, obviously, in this case, mostly in glory points and some surplus. Great. Okay, cool. We can see that, right? And then you see this guy, Peter. He's a son of a bitch because he's lazy. He only contributed with 12 prominence this week. We need to whip him, you know? <laughs> obviously, I leave this in your hands, totally. But you see you see the, the, the power of being able to uh, maintain and see. I'm Peter. <laughs> <coughs> It's it's a it's a good way to see activityness and if people are contributing because they can also lose prominence, lousy as hell, or if they're even more suspect, maybe this is a spy for the enemies or something, you know, this could be a tell, a cue for you, some information. <laughs> so this is an example of running a city. We are currently at rank two. We may need to rearrange the fonts and 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 color to make every section clear. Uh, in this case, we have a city named Dragon's Lair Hills. Obviously, you will be able to name your city. Uh, and currently, we see that in this case, we are rank 2. And to level up our rank to the next rank, level 3, uh, we need to fulfill, in this case, the prominence points here. And we need to actually capture three supply towers. And we need to keep them controlled for two hours simultaneously. So that means if enemies cut the supply towers in your last hour, you have to redo it. Uh, obviously, we want to have sim same name rules apply to city names such as player names. So... Obviously, we hope that players can follow that rule, right? Then we have some very important information for everyone. So anyone that is part of this guild access this territory window. So you can see your city upkeep. Okay, it costs this much gold, this much prominence every hour, which lasts us for X amount of days. Our reserves have this much put in. That means it will last for this long time, right? It gives you good information. So you have full coverage of everything. You know why it's going negative. You know why it only lasts for this many days and so on, right? And you will see the city defense based on the supply lines and supply towers, uh, their current status, which will also show you, holy shit, we are weak for any, you know, real siege. We need, we better get go working, you know, towards that. So we see the supply lines on or there. You see how many connect supply lines. You can only have two, right? And those are the keep owners. So in this case, one is connected, one is damaged, and therefore we are missing out on some of the... And then supply towers, you can take as many as you can spread across the world. There's no, you know, specific rules. If you claim it, you own it and it's connected. You have to, you, you have the tools to identify what you can do to cut down prices and fire NPC services to be able to sustain your city again and get back on your feet. Uh, and yeah, you will see how much of area space you are controlling. You have visitors, how successful your city is, if there's a lot of population, a lot of trades that can also promote some different bonuses. Got a die wolf. I just casually mount it. And away I go.
all right so now we have enabled the mountable functions right try this little baby the terrible look at that badass mf <laughs> and there we go we got a freaking terrible mount who it is who it is <laughs> who it is the freaking pig master <laughs> the pig master many of you have said oh my god my horse died holy shit we need to ride for hours now to get this other horse for my friend why not do this whoops why not do this one moment i'm gonna show you what i mean why not do this so i'm riding here my friend is over there right and he says please take me take me and i say okay i offer you a ride thank you my sir and up he goes bam bam two riders on one mount baby and there we go there we go we got it guys i also got it because my fucking fingers are bleeding because uh, this uh, took uh, 2250 cuts anyway here's the random questions and answers list scorpion ballista will maybe also have a fire option and some ammunition varieties for siege weapons will come an alert tower will give you a message when enemies are nearby or starting a siege more points of interest will come and more content will come mounting smaller animals will be balanced also two riders on one mount will be balanced naming bags will come very soon last online time of someone in the guild top ritual tables will come pet armors and bags will come armors even for chickens yeah no joke henrik said chickens a tactile table will come where you can see the territories of the guilds security zones and zone rules will also come when a building got sieged there's something like a very low insurance just for example if you lose your house and you have uh, 48 hours to uh, get back there and get your loot out of that shit before everyone else can loot that just for example horses will stay one of the best viable options for mounts so don't worry for balance issues wagons system will come someday and also the ship system the ship system is based on a wagon system but this is something for later holy fucking shit that was a nightmare to cut so i hope you now enough know now now enough know you know what i mean um to uh, about uh, to oh god my my brain now you know enough about territory control i at least hope so ha that line was correct so please leave a like and subscribe that would be fucking awesome and ring 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 the bell and i'm sorry that it's 26 minutes now but um yeah I, I couldn't compress it any any more more wasn't possible so special thanks to all the supporters of course carmel professor olo carrios love gaming the spicy gentleman ronos patanax vip colombo do canopo you and all the others of course and never forget to territory control hard i mean uh party hard and see you all next time goodbye